E-Tech, baby. All right, so today we are in the Miata for men, as some like to call it, basically the Honda S2000. And I'm super excited to drive this car. But before I do, if you guys enjoy the video, make sure you like it. And if you wanna see more content like this, please subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And I'm gonna take a risk finally. I think I mentioned it in a couple other videos in the past, but I'm gonna finally take a risk today. I'm gonna to drop the top and drive this car the way it's meant to be driven. And honestly, the main reason I'm gonna do it is because it's kind of cramped and claustrophobic in here for my height. But we're gonna discuss that a little later. And mostly we're gonna discuss why the Honda S2000 is so special. So let's drop the top and let's get it out onto the road. sunny day so let's set off here in the s2000 got a lot of traffic out here today partner oh horses no way hopefully this audio isn't absolutely terrible um it definitely is a risk i'm taking by <laughs> doing the top down but i'm gonna try to speak up and hopefully this audio isn't so messed up now the real thing that makes this car special is the engine i'm not gonna make you guys wait for it i'm not gonna bury the lead look the engine is truly the special or most special part of this car and it's because as you guys will see right now it redlines at 8000 rpm so this car can really scream and it's actually a little bit overwhelming because it's kind of that same sensation i felt in the uh, 911 gt3 rs with a super super high red line you have to ring the car out it's obviously naturally aspirated and you you really you have to engage with the car it's not the kind of car that just putting around it feels super fast or super quick for that matter here on a little bit of a twistier road you can definitely have fun but you need to keep it higher up in the rev range which i'm sure is causing a lot of noise so hopefully again not messing with the audio too much but as I slow down here for a moment, that's the true special character of this car, it's this motor. Now, this happens to be an AP2, and for those of you who, who know, and maybe have a keen eye and have noticed, obviously this is again the AP2, so this is a 2006 model. Um, when this car first came out, the S2000 first came out in 1999, it very closely resembled the concept car, and that AP1 model lasted until, until 2003, and from 2004 until 2009, when the car was discontinued, there was the AP2 model. Again, so this is an 06, kind of in the middle range of that AP2 generation. And what that really means is they did a couple exterior revisions to the car, which again is why I said some of you may have already noticed. The front bumper is a little bit different. The exhausts are oval shaped. The headlights and taillights are also a little different, although these have been tinted, so it's a little harder to tell um, in this particular instance. The headrests also don't have a mesh in the middle of them, although I believe maybe some of the very early AP2 cars still had that. And the biggest difference, of course, is the engine. In the AP1, it was a 2-liter inline 4, naturally aspirated, of course. Here, it is a 2.2-liter inline 4, still naturally aspirated, still making the same roughly 237 horsepower. It now makes about 6% more torque at 162 pound-feet up from 153. That doesn't sound like a tremendous amount more torque although the area under the curve is much larger and the car is just a bit punchier down low the downside of this is that the red line has been brought down from the absolutely tantalizing 8800 rpm red line in the ap1 down to a slightly more tame 8000 rpm red line here in the ap2 which is still ridiculous and this is still the type of car that you have to ring out so here peak power uh, peak torque is made at 6800 rpm and peak power is at uh, 7,800 RPM. So they have about a thousand pound, a thousand RPM, you know, true power band there. And it's, it's high up, right? You got to be in that 
you know, range. So when you get to around 6,000 RPM, you really feel that VTEC kick in. So I'm gonna see if I can demonstrate that for you guys, if there's a little bit of a straightaway here, because you really, you hear a difference when the engine gets into the cam and, and you feel it of course as well. So let's see, this is probably maybe a good place to give you a little demonstration of that here if we, and at six, there we go, VTEC baby. <laughs> So the car is definitely wakes up up there and gets a little more excited. Let me loop around. With the top down, I, you know, I'm definitely comfortable in the sense of headroom, but I still feel like I'm sitting very high up in this car and you have very limited adjustability. So the steering wheel itself does not adjust in any direction, doesn't telescope, move up or down or anything, it's fixed in place. And the seat, of course, can go forward and back, but I mean, this is the furthest it goes back and I'm still probably sitting too close, especially considering the fact that I can't bring the wheel up or move it in any way. So my knees are kind of in the wheel and it reminds me of an older, like Italian sports car. Like when I've sat in a Ferrari F355, I feel the same way where the wheel is kind of in my knees. And yeah, so that's definitely an interesting sensation. And I think if you're probably under six foot, I'd even imagine the ideal height range for this car being somewhere in that five, six, five, seven to maybe five, eleven range. Uh, you're, you're, I mean, you're in the sweet spot, so you're perfect. You're golden. Here at about uh, six two for me, it's a little rough. It's definitely manageable and doable, but not perfect, and you know, a little tight. Now, the pro of that is the car itself is not so big, and it's very light. So this car weighs around 2,800 pounds, maybe just a touch more than 2,800 here as an AP2 model. So you definitely notice the car is very eager uh, at the top of the rev range, which is really the answer to the title of this video, which is why is the S2000 so special? Well, it's a combination of that low 2,800 pound, roughly 2,800 pound weight, and this exciting and uh, aggressive motor that's willing to rev out even in the AP2 all the way to 8,000 and the AP1 almost to 9,000 RPM. So that's the real exciting and special character of this car, something you probably will not find ever again, at least not from a four cylinder. And this car is very special in the eyes of enthusiasts because it provides this unique driving experience. Now, the height thing is an issue and the handling, um, the steering's very direct. My issue, maybe it's that I've just hopped out of a Camaro ZL1 just a few days ago. It's hard to compete with that level of lateral grip and kind of the confidence inspiring nature of a car like that. And maybe it's the fact that this is a car that's ultimately over 20 years old, um, at least in its you know original state, but it doesn't feel quite as capable in stock form. So that kind of brings me actually to the fact that this car is stock. Yes, it has tinted headlights and taillights and it has a little funky cup holder mod in here, which we'll get to in a second. But aside from those two things, it's 100% stock, suspension is stock, and even though the uh, AP2 models had a slightly revised rear suspension uh, to make them a little bit more balanced to the limit, I think the AP1 cars were a little bit more likely to break loose, which sounds exciting, but also, you know, maybe it doesn't provide the fastest lap times. Honda hearing the criticism of owners and journalists of the time, made those revisions, but the car still doesn't feel tremendous. I mean, if I give it, put a little gas here, uh, it held in there. I thought it was gonna break loose a little easier than it did, but ultimately it's, it's not the most confidence inspiring handling. I think because it's not a modern day car and maybe it's the tires it's on, but it also doesn't have the widest tires, 215s in the front, 245s in the back, both 17 inches. So relatively small diameter. They don't look too small on this body, but the wheels aren't, aren't absolutely massive. And, and they're not, again, so wide. I think they're eight inches wide in the, back, in the rear, maybe eight and a half. So I haven't driven an AP1 to directly compare, but even this feels a little bit more tail happy than a lot of modern cars, or at least, again, not quite as balanced to me. Now, I, I may be a little bit, I may be a little bit biased, again, just because of those couple cars I drove that are just, modern day, especially the ZL1, modern day track weapons. Kind of unfair comparison. Now, despite all of that, and while this car is certainly not any sort of drag weapon, at least not stock, 
it still does zero to 60 in about 5.4, 5.5 seconds, um, at least with a proper launch on a prep surface. And it's more of like a seven second, five to 60, meaning a street start, really what you're gonna be doing out there. Quarter mile in about 14.1 seconds at 97 miles an hour. So nothing blisteringly quick, again, compared to the likes of even my little mid-level three series sedan these days. Um, but it's right in line with a brand new ND Miata, believe it or not, which is kind of the only remaining, and maybe only all-time competitor to this car. So back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I wanna say that's when the NB Miatas were coming out, and this was, this came out to kind of compete with that car. It is sort of referred to as the Miata for men because it's a little bit bigger, a little bit more aggressive looking, you know, than the Miata, but ultimately it's a car that evokes the exact same emotions as the Miata top down, only came in a, in a convertible in fact, only came in a manual, and kind of believed in that same Japanese ethos of pure driving, pleasure and enjoyment, and no other fuss. So despite keeping up with this in a straight line, uh, the modern Miatas, the NDs, which have improved in certain other ways just by virtue of being or you know, continuing to come out year after year, still feel a little bit less special in this car. Surely that red line plays a role, the fact that this engine just screams and goes so hard. Um, but another factor, I think, is some of the interior treatments. They both lack a lot of storage space. Like this has no proper glove box, only really one cubby here. But it has this like sort of semi-digital dash, which was definitely cutting edge in 1999. It still kind of impresses me. It's still both functional and pleasing to look at. And I guess it's not that I'm expecting the Miata to have features such as that. It's more just that this feels more like a special car. It feels almost more like a supercar um, on the inside. I'm being a little bit hyperbolic when I say that, but you have these kind of like little pods on either side that remind me of the Ferrari 458. Of course, this by almost 10 years precedes the 458. So if anyone got inspiration from anyone, it was Italy from Japan. But you have this very nice driver-oriented cluster and dash design, otherwise very simple, very plain. And here coming out of a little turn, the car just feels exciting. Sure, I feel a little bit big in here. And sure, there are a few things that really do feel antiquated even within the driving experience, just we live in a world now where turbo power has gotten to the point where it gives you so much low end torque and pull that sometimes driving some of these high revving naturally aspirated cars as exciting and as much of an occasion as it is, it just seems so impractical when you even begin to contemplate this car as some sort of daily or as some sort of frequent used vehicle in the city. Of course, that's not its intention or intended purpose, but those are the things that kind of go through your head because modern cars have such a Jekyll and Hyde dichotomy to them where you can put them into some sort of eco mode and just put around and then pop them into some sort of sport mode and slay in the canyons. Now this car doesn't have any sort of drive modes. Man the manual transmission, which is arguably one of the best, definitely the best I've ever driven. I've heard it's one of the best kind of period. It lacks any sort of modern gimmicks like auto rev match, hill start assist. Of course, the car itself lacks a rear view camera. So again, that all adds to the charm, but of course, leaves sometimes a bit to be desired in the modern day, or when you're looking at this car as a potential, you know, $25,000, $35,000, sometimes even $45,000 car here in 2021 at current market value, depending on condition, depending on mileage, and slightly depending on AP1 versus AP2. Uh, some of the CRs, which I believe stand for club racing, can fetch upwards of $60,000, sometimes $70,000, $80,000 if they're in perfect condition. So when you're considering that, then some of these things do matter a little more compared to a modern Cayman, for instance. I gotta say, the trunk is pretty small in this. It's a funny kind of sized or shaped trunk. You have actually, you have your spare tire in the trunk. It's kind of hidden and not hidden at the same time. And one thing I thought was funny was I got in the car and I was saying, oh, is there a you know, little button to release the trunk inside? I went down to the footwell near where the uh, hood latch is and there was no button. I found out it's actually in here 
you guys can see it, it's right there. That is how you pop open the trunk of a uh, S2000 by a button in this little center compartment or cubby. So it has, you know, funky charm all the way down to where some buttons are placed and how it definitely looks is sporty as well as special. But let's give it a little, let's give it a little ring out here. Definitely getting the car up to the top of the rev band where that VTEC lays at over 6,000 RPM is where the real excitement's at. I certainly enjoy pushing this car. It's not, you know, the kind of thing you want to do all day, every day, but when you get it past about 6,000 and VTEC kicks in and the real power and you're in the cam and you feel all of those vibrations, you hear the engine and you, you feel the power finally really coming through and, and you know, pull you out of a, you know, a corner or, or through a straightaway, that's when the real excitement of the S2000 comes in. This video would not be complete without a quick tall boy test. And I did mention that this has a mod, which is that the owner of this car has put two cup holders in. So, I mean, it has a little tiny cup holder as it is up here, but now in this particular version, you get an additional two cup holders. So let's do a little tall boy test and we'll wrap the video up. It screams in a way that you don't find in many modern cars. I mean, listen to that. So exciting. So exciting. It really is, <laughs> it really is exciting. So I will give you guys one last big pull here, show off that VTEC, show off that 8,000 RPM red line and really where the power in this engine lies. Let's, let's do it. VTEC, baby! There it is. VTEC, <laughs> one more, one more. There it is. Super exciting. And again, I'm gonna hope that the audio worked out here and that you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, remember to subscribe. Comment down below, let me know what videos you guys are trying to see. I'll do my best to make it happen. And as always, this is Rio, peace out.